All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Clemente Diaz. I'm one of the co-chairs of the CUNY IO Practitioners Network. Uh, if you're new to our events, uh, basically the CUNY IO Practitioner Network is a group of individuals within CUNY who are interested in applying the research theory and practice of industrial organizational psychology to the workplace. Um, today, we're going to be having a special presentation on uh, becoming an evidence-based practitioner. And we're excited to have Michael, who is a research scientist at uh, MHS Assessments, uh, talking about the topic and how it differs from other um, approaches to decision making within higher education, specifically uh, best practices. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Michael uh, and we'll get started. Okay, perfect. I will go ahead and share my screen. Always the most tense part of a presentation for me. So, so let me know if you can see it okay. Let me see anything yet, just as I started sharing the screen, but it's... Oh, one second. I think I'm uh, stalling a little bit. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, we're live. Good. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, let's, if I if my if I'm looking at different screens, I've got a few of them going on here. Um, today's conversation. I'm so excited to be here with everybody uh, to talk about evidence based practice, how to apply it, what it means, um, what it looks like, and for the purpose of this conversation. Um, if you want to eat your lunch, have your cameras off, totally fine. But I want to encourage you, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to just turn your mic on and, and ask or uh, contribute um, in, in any way. I want to make sure that this conversation speaks to some things that are going on uh, for you and that might be relevant to you. So uh, just don't hesitate to do that. And so I'll start with a, with a brief disclaimer here. Disclaimer number one. I think it's unlikely that I'll share new groundbreaking ideas that will radically change your perspective uh, and teach you things that you don't already know or do in some respect. Um, these ideas, evidence-based practice has been around for a while, though maybe not as long as uh, you might expect in different fields. And like we'll get into, these are things that you probably engage with in your personal life, in your work uh, to different extents, but hopefully we'll give some larger context, broaden your thinking around it, and give you uh, different ways to, to engage with evidence. And so just to, uh, to open up the discussion, I wanted to ask, to what extent was your decision to join this conversation today evidence-based? And I know it's, it's a tough question to throw out without having defined anything or talked about what, what evidence is or what evidence-based practice or decision making looks like, but um, just to, to frame that a little bit, when you think about your decision to, to come, number one, did you have any goals or benefits, whether you explicitly or implicitly understood them, that you might want to get out of this talk today? And when you think about the decision to come, maybe as more of a prediction in the confidence that you have that this talk will help you achieve those goals and benefits, was there any evidence that you leaned on that would support that prediction? And you're all here. And, and whether or not you did have evidence, right? Maybe the, the goal that you want out of this conversation is to learn more about a topic you're already interested in or to take something away uh, that you can start implementing in your work. And maybe some evidence, maybe you've come to some previous talks uh, that Clemente and Robinson have put on and you found them useful. Uh, maybe you've heard about uh, the topic about me, about my organization, there's some, perhaps some evidence that you used to inform your decision to come. And if not, that's good too. Uh, at the end of the day, it's an hour's conversation. I think it's going to be useful to you. If, again, <laughs> if you're finding it's not, ask a question, share, share a comment, um, and let's try and have a conversation around uh, topics that you can really use. 
And so, like I said, this uh, evidence-based practice, evidence-based decision-making, we use evidence all the time to make decisions about all sorts of different things. And, and just to give you an example, um, let's move this slide forward. Okay. So I hope you're seeing the screen okay. Um, this is a movie that just came out on Netflix called Red Notice. Has anybody seen it? Not yet, it's in my queue. Okay. So Clemente, have you seen it? No, I have not. Okay, I see a thumbs up. So I wasn't sure how to interpret that. Um, it's, it just came out on Netflix. It's like their biggest uh, release of a movie yet. And for a lot of people, right? The decision whether or not to watch this movie is the type of decision that they would want to be informed by evidence. And ironically, it's often the smaller decisions that we look for more evidence than the bigger ones, uh, something like this. And so the first place you might go is maybe you go to IMDb and you say, okay, well, who's in this movie? Um, the Rock is in it, Ryan Reynolds, Gal Gadot. And that might be enough. You say, Wonder Woman's in this. I'm absolutely going to watch it. I love everything that she's in. I love watching The Rock. That might be a reliable source of evidence to make the prediction that you're going to enjoy this movie. Or maybe you don't really care about who's in the movie. And so you go to Rotten Tomatoes and you look at the reviews and you see 35% of critics uh, liked it, not so great, but 91% of the audience was in favor. And again, as a source of evidence, you might critique um, the, the critics or the audience scores for their validity, their reliability. And, and what I mean by that is in the past, maybe you've used one or another and it's more reliably helped you predict what you know, what you like, what you don't like. Um, you also might know the types of things that critics care about. And maybe those are the things that you care about too, but maybe they're not, right? In this case for me, uh, it's a light, fun action comedy movie. A high audience score is perfect for me because I know I can just sit back and enjoy it like most people did and maybe not worry so much about meaningful themes or plot continuity. Um, and so I enjoyed it. Maybe you will too. But again, it's the kind of thing we use all the time. But the question is, do you use it enough in your work? Do you acquire evidence actively from different sources to inform your pro the, the problems and your perceptions of problems as well as potential solutions? Do you critically evaluate the quality of the evidence that you're getting? Do you, again, like do, do you aggregate that information in a systematic and explicit way to help inform decisions? These are the kinds of questions that, um, that I hope we'll bring out in this conversation, but that you can um, start to engage with as you think about evidence-based practice and what it means for you. But like I said, it's been around a while. It's not um, new, it's not groundbreaking. And the central premise of evidence-based practice is really simple. It's just decisions, decisions should be made using the best available evidence. That's it, that's really the central premise. Um, now there's obviously a lot to that. There are a lot of associations there, but the goal isn't to know all of the answers or understand the truth or make the right decision every time, but to more conscientiously, explicitly and judiciously use evidence to better articulate problems and arrive at more informed decisions. Um, one assumption here is that being more informed about the decisions you make is gonna be a good thing, right? Why wouldn't you want to better understand the problems uh, better understand different types of solutions. And, and we'll get into, this is a simple statement, but there's a lot of reasons wh why this might work in practice or some challenges behind it. Um, but again, the, the best available evidence used to inform your decisions, that's really the goal of the, of the discussion and the goal of evidence-based practice. And so it begs the question, and uh, if anybody has any questions or, or comments, again, I can take a brief pause, but feel free to just uh, unmute yourself and chime in at any point. Otherwise, I'll just, I'll keep steamrolling through here, but it begs the question, what is evidence? And I'll, I'll put it out to, to you all. 
what I mean, when I ask the question, what is evidence? What do you think about what, what comes to mind? And anybody can feel free to unmute, unmute yourself. Peer reviewed studies. Can you say that again? Peer reviewed studies? Peer reviewed studies. Perfect. That's that that's absolutely a form of evidence. Anything else? I think any data, right? Um, whether it's just recording student traffic, um, that's evidence that something is happening, or uh, I don't know, uh, uh, like number of cars on the street, it's evidence that things are happening. Um, right, so any information uh, could be evidence for something potentially. So I think both comments are absolutely right, but in a general sense, uh, evidence is just information, facts, or data that would support or contradict a claim, assumption, or hypothesis. And uh, for, for a bit of context, I mean, this is the IO Psych network. I have an IO Psych background. Evidence-based practice, for me, the way I study it, the way I use it is in the context of management. So evidence-based management is typically where I come from. Um, and when I think about the types of data that are used within organizations, um, they boil down into four general areas, right? And peer-reviewed studies are often the first type of thing that comes to mind, especially if you're in an academic setting. Scientific literature is, uh, is a great source of evidence, um, but you know it has challenges as well. Sometimes it can be hard to uh, critically evaluate uh, scientific literature. It can be uh, hard to access at times. It may be relevant, more or less relevant to, to the challenges that you're trying to solve or to the population that you're working with. But it is, uh, in, in many cases, a really foundational source of evidence for making decisions. Another is organizational data. And I think uh, you, you had mentioned uh, student traffic as, as an example of organizational data, um, the type of data that you might collect uh, within your organization that you can access through internal databases. Again, um, the, a benefit could be that it's probably more relevant, right? It's to specific to, the, to a population that you're trying to work with. Um, it might be hard to access. It might be hard to aggregate or get your hands on. Um, and so that, that's another source of evidence. A third is stakeholder input. Uh, if you think about user research, um, working with the population directly that you're trying to uh, have an intervention with, Right, so whether it's the students, maybe you survey students, you survey teachers, um, and you get their input on a problem or ideas for solutions. And the last is practitioner expertise. Um, and it's important to call this one out in particular because practitioner expertise is something that we lean on all the time, right? Things that you've learned, things that you bring to the table as, as a leader, as an individual, as somebody with years of experience, that shouldn't be discounted and it shouldn't be lost in the conversation about evidence-based decisions because it can be extremely useful. Um, but it should be noted that this is often the area of, of evidence that we overuse and over lean on. Um, when we think about expertise and, and the ways that you develop expertise, we often use years of experience as a proxy, right? For somebody's expertise, but it's a, it's a bit of a poor um, indicator of somebody's expertise. And part of the reason is that in different domains, it can be easier or more difficult to develop that. And if you think about, for example, like a, a surgeon and their expertise compared to uh, a manager, right? Somebody who's managed people for 20 years and their comparative expertise, they're gonna be very different. Um, can anybody think about why uh, a surgeon might develop expertise in a different way than uh, you know your your average manager? Well, I, I mean, I guess i'll I'll give you the answer. I mean, a, a couple ways that it would be different. One is that a surgeon does more repetitive, uh, tasks, right? There's more repetition where a manager might deal with more broad problems, right? So the practice that they get is more diffuse and the learning is also different because a surgeon 
will do a surgery and will get feedback, uh, very clear feedback on what the outcome of that surgery is. A manager might do an intervention, uh, solve a problem, and not necessarily evaluate or learn from it in, in the same way. So it's good to be cautious of expertise and respectful of it, but also you know, incorporate it into an evidence-based process. And so to take a step back, evidence-based uh, practice really only kicked off in the 90s with evidence-based medicine. And I'm from Toronto, I'm here in Toronto, and uh, this is really where evidence-based medicine got its start. Uh, in a study in 1991, they found that only 15% of medical practices at the time were aligned with the best available evidence, which is kind of shocking to think about, but it was a big turning point for the field. And over time, through the late 90s, it, it was adopted by other uh, professions. So evidence-based education, policing, uh, public policy, um, conservation, social care, and evidence-based management uh, is kind of a work in progress. At this point, 2005, 2010, it really started uh, to get going. Uh, so it's been around for a while, although perhaps not, not as long as you might have, not might, might have assumed. Um, and so I want to give you an example of how we thought of uh, medical advice or parenting advice in the past and how it's changed with evidence and why it's really hard for, for people to think about a world before evidence-based, evidence-informed practice. So this book is called Dr. Spock's Baby and Child Care. Does this uh, look familiar to anybody on the call? I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. it's like the famous book about taking care of babies, right? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, came out in the mid-40s. It's been through uh, a lot of you know, new editions, preprints has been around for a long time and uh, it sold well over 50 million copies. And when it came out in the 40s, it was one of the reasons it got so popular was it, it kind of flew in the face of some conventional parenting practices and parenting advice at the time. For example, uh, in the 40s, 30s, 40s, good parenting practice was rigid scheduling and tended towards more uh, non affection. Uh, because you don't want to make your kids weak, you want to make them tough, right? And Dr. Spock's Baby and Child Care Guide advocated for more empathetic, understanding, caring. Again, hard to think about a time before that was conventional wisdom, but it, it really kind of uh, flew in the face of that. But one thing that Dr. Spock's Baby and Child Care book uh, advised was for children or for babies to sleep on their stomachs, to sleep in a prone position. And I don't know exactly why they thought that was a good idea, but um, what it led to was a massive spike in SIDS, which is um, infant uh, mortality. And studies, even in the early 70s, there was enough solid evidence that this was happening because of prone sleeping. But even still, the book uh, was revised. They didn't change their advice. And the, uh, the infant mortality uh, caused by that advice is estimated to be about 60,000 babies. And there were external initiatives. Uh, one was called, uh, let me find it. It was called Safe to Sleep, the campaign, to tell, to tell parents that children shouldn't be sleeping on their stomachs, they should be sleeping on their backs. And eventually the book was changed. Uh, but you can see the data that as the uh, prevalence of prone sleeping amongst babies went down, the SIDS rates de declined very much uh, in line with that, right? And so the evidence uh, was there. Uh, it wasn't used. It wasn't listened to. People listened to Dr. Spock and his advice. And, um, and this is uh, a prime example of the utility and the importance of evidence-based decision-making. And it's, it's hard to think, again, um, why we would engage with uh, non-evidence-based practices when uh, evidence can really help us make much more informed and better decisions with better outcomes. Uh, any, any comments, questions to this point as we think about, I'm gonna switch gears in a second and talk about uh, how evidence-based decision-making can help us, but uh, any reflections from, from this first bit here? No. Not right now. 
Okay, that's fine. So let me ask you all a question. To what extent do you think that different generations, boomers, millennials, Gen Z, have different attitudes towards work? When you think about that, do you think there's big differences, moderate differences, no difference? What do you think? I think there are significant differences. Um, there's just expectations that people have of work. Um, are They span. Um, my husband is a different generation than myself, and he laughs at some of the conversations that are actual conversations in, especially in higher ed as well, in our field versus, you know, a bunch of Gen Xers that, you know, yelling curse at each other, and um, <laughs> they just figure it out. So it's a, uh, I would say moderate, maybe big. Moderate to big. Any other opinions? Dissenting opinions, maybe. I, I would think that it's big simply because there are different intentions behind working, depending on the generation. I feel like the newer generation is more so working for survival, whereas later generations were not so much doing that. Like you have to pay for bills and food and rent now, which is why so many people are working one, two, three jobs to just survive. Whereas I don't think that was the same case Right, so different circumstances has led to different attitudes and uh, needs between generations. Mm -hmm. I guess I guess I would want to know what we were comparing it to. So, like, our age differences bigger or smaller than cultural differences or gender differences, right? So, like, what do we mean by big? You know, well, big. I mean, it's actually. I mean, it's a statistical expression to say it would have a large effect that we would easily observe. And, and that the evidence, the scientific evidence would bear out that there's big differences in the way that people would maybe respond to survey questions, for example. It might be bigger, not as big as other, uh, like you mentioned, gender differences or et cetera. But, um, and I'm just noticing there's comments in the chat. I apologize if I miss them. Um, so again, if you, if you want to stop me, if I miss something and you want to call it out, please do. I'll push forward with this though, because I mean, there's an answer here. The answer is somewhere between small to no differences based on the best available evidence, which is a number of different meta-analyses that looked at a lot of different studies on generational differences. And uh, just uh, an excerpt from one of them, that there's little solid empirical evidence supporting generationally based differences and almost no theory behind why such differences should even exist. Pattern of results indicates that the relationships between generational membership and work-related outcomes are moderate to small or essentially zero in many cases. Um, now, I put this in, um, I don't want to get too bogged down in it. I know it's a bit of a complex conversation. There's a lot of different factors to this, but all I'll say is that the concept of generational differences is based on a cohort theory, the idea that if people are born around the same time period, likely they experience different things or similar things, similar upbringings that would shape their attitudes and their, and their orientation of personalities. Um, the theory has very little basis in science, in evidence, um, there's really no reason to think that arbitrary cutoff dates, um, let's say you were born 1985 before or after that you would have uh, significantly different attitudes than somebody born before that cutoff or that you would share attitudes with people of that cohort. Um, generally speaking, differences that we observe that we attribute to generations are really age differences, right? Different stages of life uh, is, is typically the better uh, explanation for the differences that we observe. Um, and the reason I mention this is because when we think about the articulation of problems that we observe, we see, for example, the young people in our workplace are disengaged, they're leaving, right? They're, they're exhibiting some kind of behavior. If we articulate the problem as, well, what's going on with my Gen Zs, my millennials? How do I better manage them? We go down a very different path to solving that problem than if we ask the question differently and say, what's going on with our younger uh, employees, students, uh, and, and articulate it more from the perspective of age uh, would probably give us a better path to finding a, a solution. Um, again, I'm happy to talk about this more uh, maybe later if you, if you wanna talk about it. Uh, I see a hand raised. Hello, I, 
I usually I, I've heard those type of comments. Oh, the millennials, the Gen X, the Gen Y. And I, I usually cringe about it because even within people who are born in the same year or in the same city could have vastly different political and social views on things like that's why we have, you know, <laughs> different debates. So just the assumption that, oh, you know, a person born on this thing is super conservative and a person born in this time is super liberal like that's i i find i always found it ridiculous um there are patterns though when it comes to like technology and things you grew up with if you know what a vcr is versus if you have grown up always streaming your mp3s um and your videos like i could see that but um some of the other things that people just assume is a generational thing I, I i just don't i don't always i like you said it's it's tied to other things having to do with age and upbringing and religion and things like that yeah no great great point uh, and i think that was a good articulation of, of some of the uh dissonance that people have with with an idea like that um and technology social media that's always the thing people focus on when it comes to generational differences if we draw a new delineation for a new generation it's often because they are more tech uh, savvy. They grew like they just have more technology. For some reason, technology seems to be the thing that's driving what people perceive as these differences. Um, and it's possible that there might be some differences in how different people relate to technology and how they grew up with it. But that's not where uh, generational differences stops for most people. We assume when we say you're a millennial that that encompasses more areas of your life, that it's more stable across your life, you're always going to be a millennial, and that always means you're going to be in some way similar to other millennials and different from people of other generations where uh, that doesn't really bear out as far as uh, the, the literature or the evidence. Um, again, happy to talk about it more um, or share some, some research on it, uh, but I'll push forward here to talk maybe more materially about evidence-based management and how it can help us. And I want to uh, one big way that it can help us is with regard to shiny new ideas, fads in the evidence-based management and HR world. We deal with this all the time. HR is notorious for uh, latching onto the newest fad and the newest idea. Um, and so, uh, I mean, why do we follow fads? Why do we latch onto these ideas? And I think there's a, a number of different reasons. I, I'll go through them quickly, but one is we see other people doing it. Right, the, there's uh, this organization, this school, right? They're implementing it. That must mean that there's something to it. It must be good. Uh, it might be a quick fix to a complex problem. Uh, it's often well marketed. The media might get behind it. Um, consultancies, people who have a vested interest might be pushing it very strongly. Uh, there's always a book about it that gets very popular. Um, it, it looks and feels good in the sense of it's often the type of thing that you want to be seen as doing by other people. Um, it often makes big promises if you, you know, that, that it's going to solve big problems um, and, and have some overstated uh, promises and, and it may simplify what is actually a, a more complex problem, right? And so we might be drawn to, to a fad or to a new idea for any of these reasons. Evidence and evidence-based decision-making is very much the opposite. Uh, we have to do it ourselves. Yes, we incorporate information from external and internal sources, but we, there's, there's more work that goes into it that we have to do. It does take more time and effort. It's poorly marketed in the sense of, I mean, it's incredibly unsexy compared to shiny new ideas, great resignation, Gen Z, right? The hype that gets built up around those things, evidence-based practice, um, is, is very much the opposite of that. And it doesn't always look and feel good to engage with. Uh, it might lead you to question things that you uh, believed, deeply held ideas. Um, it can sometimes be uncomfortable or painful to, to get involved with. Uh, it makes more realistic promises and it doesn't simplify problems. There, there's nuance and complexity involved, right? And so for all of these reasons, uh, it, the, the, I think these present as barriers to really engaging with and using evidence uh, in our decision-making, where fads, again, easier to communicate, they're more pervasive, it's just an easier path to follow typically. 
But then uh, one question to, uh, to ask is which goal or what set of goals, what types of goals might a FAD or an evidence-based practice satisfy? And when you think about different types of goals that an organization ha might have or leaders might have, typically there are espoused goals, which are things that we explicitly state maybe on a website or in a presentation, things like we're gonna do what works, we're going to accomplish our core mission and solve important problems, speak truth to power and all of these great things that we say we're going to do. But at the same time, the implicit goals, right? The things that are really there, the things that you engage with day to day are not to do what works, but to do things quickly, right? To get things done, to have a bias for action, to not accomplish the core mission, but to avoid getting in trouble and to fix surface problems rather than to spend the time and invest the effort to solve more important problems and to say what people want to hear, right? As opposed to speaking truth to power. Um, I think that it, it's my opinion that fads and, and new ideas very much satisfy the implicit goals where evidence and evidence-based practices speak more to espoused goals, right? And help you really move the needle on challenges and, and important problems. Um, in my role, as a, I work as a research uh, scientist, I develop uh, assessments that organizations use for coaching and for training. And we also, I do consulting to help organizations build programs around that. And one thing I see all the time is uh, organizations that do like one-off initiatives. We're going to do a one-day training. We're going to do a seminar, a workshop on this, right? And often that doesn't move the needle. That's the type of thing that uh, looks good, right? It's But it's not a, the, a real investment in moving the needle. And um, again, it's, it's easier to satisfy implicit goals than the espoused goals. And so I'll, I'll put this to you as a point of reflection here. Can you think of an organizational practice or an institutional practice that you suspect might not be aligned with the best available evidence? And it might be something that you do, um, again, because it's aligned with implicit goals as opposed to espoused goals or for any of the reasons that we mentioned before. If you feel comfortable sharing you know, one idea, something that comes to mind, I'd love to hear it. Uh, if not, I'll take a moment just to, to let you think about it and, um, and percolate on it. I just threw one in the chat. Um, course offerings at our institutions are often rolled over from term to term. And we are, as advisors, lovingly encouraging faculty and faculty to uh, look at who's actually enrolled for courses to provide um, a better idea of how many students do need seats for the following term. And, and why do you think that persists? Is it expedience? I don't want to get political here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that I think that's a great example. I think it's um, like you said, it's something that that's done that happens. I think there could be lots of reasons for it. Um, and I think to your point as well, it might be it's the type of thing that might be improved with a little bit more basis in evidence, in the gathering of evidence that can support uh, better offerings. And it happens at Baruch too, so it's not just laziness. <laughs> I mean, to that point, I also feel like it has to do with resources as well. Do you have the faculty who was able to teach and offer more courses? So it's like, we want, we know that certain courses may need to be offered in more sections to provide the supply to the students, but we are, are we able to provide that on the faculty side to teach it? Right. So those are all, I mean, it all goes hand in hand. Word for that, right? It's realistic allocation of resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I appreciate that. Anything else come to mind? I think one of the um, things that we're all struggling with now is working remotely versus being in an office. And, you know, it, it's it's a different experience for everybody, but, you know, it's it seems like in certain spaces, it's, it's a, a, a more productive tool to be home. And the fear is that, you know, whoever makes that decision 
is not going to really make the best decision for all of us. And after struggling to get to a point where we can work from home and we can still be productive, it's, it's gonna go away as fast as it came. What do you think you could do in terms of gathering evidence to inform a decision on remote work? Nothing. And I, I say that because it's like, it's not in my control. Sure. There's, there's nothing, you know, so like if you work for CUNY, for example, you know, the governor makes that decision. It doesn't matter if I want it or my, even my boss wants it or my boss's boss wants it. The governor decides and it doesn't matter. You know, you could in, in, you know, it's kind of like you could spin in a circle trying to prove to everybody that you can reach but they're not the ones making the decision. Right, right. And uh, I think what you're talking about is a good example of a time when there are real barriers to evidence-based decision-making because A, it may not be your decision. B, even if you did gather the evidence, you wouldn't have the, uh, the authority or the means of using it to influence the decision in any meaningful way. Um, so I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm actually gonna be writing an article uh, for a publication in India where evidence-based decision-making is almost non-existent. And culturally, it's very hard uh, because of uh, hierarchy and power distance and uh, the way that organizations function in, in different cultures. Um, it doesn't always play, right? It's, it's not even always relevant to, to the ways people make decisions. You just follow after what the leaders, what the CEOs might say. So I see a couple of hands raised. Uh, Nicole? I believe someone was before me, Graciano was oh, sure. before me. Sorry about that. Um, no, I was I I was just gonna piggyback on what the other person was saying. I think Farah um, that during the pandemic, like let's say you would have like five students complain about like I don't know orientation or advisement or you know, uh, whatever the food pantry, I don't know, whatever department pick, pick it, then everybody would just jump on that and be like, Oh, my God, Oh, my God, it's horrible. It's horrible. And then but you have like 100 other students that they love it, you know, that they think that it works great. So like, where's the evidence that this is first, is it a real issue? And then is or is it just like one isolated incident? And then um, and what are we doing to to address it versus like, just throwing the whole thing out out the window um because in in many cases later on we found evidence that they're like no we had like a 92 percent you know satisfaction rate on that event or that activity um so all the rhetoric that was going on it really didn't hold water later on but the damage was done because the the screaming had already started you know great example I going to Farah's point on the remote work, I feel like too many of us, myself included, are just willing to go along with the status quo of what the upper management is telling us about returning to work. When in reality, we have the tools at our disposal to show that we are fully capable of having, if not a flexible schedule than one that can still meet the demands of the campus. They just sent out a report yesterday that said that CUNY in the last year hit record degree awarding for the entire time that we've been established. That says a lot for our productivity, not just on a campus level, but as a university level. And I'm sure that there are more information out there that we can all get, but we have to be willing to go out there and find the, find the information, find, the re, find that data that is going to prove to the upper management, whether it be our managers on the campus level, the chancellor, the governor, that we are productive and we are thriving with this flexible remote work. Great point, great point. And I'll, I'll push forward from there because I, I think some of the things I'm gonna talk about, uh, we'll touch on that and maybe we'll circle back to it as we get there. I know we're coming up on the hour and 15 minutes. So 
Uh, I'm going to push forward for, for the next bit, which I think will hopefully be useful to you all and hopefully we'll have some time for questions um, as we get through it. So I wanted to just bust some myths about evidence-based practice. Some of these are personal pet peeves, personal viewpoints. Others are things that I think people generally uh, have misconceptions about when they think about evidence-based practice. Number one, evidence-based practice is not dogmatic, which means that even if two reasonable, well-intentioned people follow evidence-based practices on the same topic, they can still come to very different conclusions. When something is positioned as an evidence-based idea, not an evidence-based idea, generally speaking, the argument, the conversation is a lot more complex, right? It's not a dogmatic enterprise, right? It's not a monolith. Number two, evidence-based practice is not about doing what the evidence says all of the time. If, again, two people, two organizations follow evidence-based practices on the same topic, you would likely expect there to be very different outcomes. Now, there might be similarities if they have the same evidence, but at the same time, it's not to say that we have to always do what the evidence says, right? We use our expertise, we use our understanding to apply evidence to inform decisions, not to make them for us. Number three, evidence-based practice is not a replacement for expertise. I think this is uh, for some people, uh, a, a bit of a misconception, a bit of a barrier to evidence-based practice. But uh, if you do have expertise, you do have experience in an area, engaging in evidence-based practices and evidence-based decision-making doesn't replace you. It doesn't make your experience and your expertise um, less valuable, right? We need expertise to apply evidence, to utilize evidence effectively, um, and to find solutions. For, uh, for problems using evidence, right? So it doesn't replace expertise. I would say that it is a complementary skill set to, uh, to somebody's expertise. Experts aren't always a good source of evidence. Uh, I think this is a very common one. People think that somebody represents an evidence-based way of thinking, and so therefore everything that they say is aligned with evidence. This is absolutely not the, not the case. Uh, experts often have vested interests. They uh, are often very smart, they have great experience, right? But this is, a, I think, an important point is to say, just because you're articulate and you come up with arguments and, and ideas based on your expertise, being smart and uh, coming up with these arguments isn't the same as having evidence for it. Again, it's, it's different, it's a different skill set, um, and they don't always align. And the last myth is that using evidence-based tools is not in evidence-based practice. And this is an important one for me because we try to make assessments at MHS that are rigorous, that are based in evidence, based in science. But just because a tool might have a grounding in evidence and research doesn't mean that you can use that tool in any way and that that will be an evidence-based practice. Um, you still need to use tools for the purposes for which they were intended, for which they were validated. Um, and evidence-based practice goes beyond just using evidence-based tools or even evidence-based ideas. There are six core skills to being an evidence-based practitioner. And looking at the time, I maybe should have put this a little bit earlier, but I'm happy to share these slides with anybody um, after. Uh, and I'll run through them quickly. Six core skills, six A's. Starts with asking, translating your problem into a question. We already uh, touched on this a couple of times, but I think this is really something that's overlooked and can solve a lot of problems, which is engaging in an evidence-based process from the outset to investigate a problem, to uh, clearly articulate it in a way that will lead you to find uh, better solutions. So starting out with an evidence-based approach to problem solving is key, asking the right questions, acquiring, systematically searching for evidence, uh, acquiring evidence from multiple sources, from scientific literature, from stakeholders, um, appraising that evidence, applying your, your critical judgment for uh, the evidence's validity, its reliability, and its relevance to the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, again, I don't think we do necessarily enough of taking a step back and actually judging the trustworthiness of the evidence that's presented to us. We then aggregate, we pull the evidence together in a systematic and explicit way. Uh, to arrive at uh, a decision and a solution. We then apply it by incorporating the evidence into our decision-making. And then uh, we assess, 
right? If we are engaging in intervention or making a decision about, let's say, work from home, work in office, come in, right? Do you then assess going forward what the outcome of your decision was? And do you learn from that? Uh, or change course if it's not working. Again, I don't think we do enough of that where we really follow the process through uh, continually to the end. Um, and I think, again, six steps, six skills as well that you can develop by doing any one of these things in a more systematic way, in a more evidence-based way, will move you closer to making that more informed decision that we're, that we're striving for. Um, and, and it's interesting to see, again, how sometimes these get skipped and overlooked. Um, one example, uh, a while back, I was talking with a, with a friend of mine who is a, was a data analyst at a very large Canadian uh, telecommunications company. They had spent millions and millions of dollars to reconfigure their office space into an open office environment. And after that had all been done, they came to the, the data team and said, can you evaluate if this was successful or not? And so they were happy to assess the outcome of their decision after the fact without having done any of the prior steps. And you can imagine that if you're given that and you have to go back to senior executives, you're pretty limited in what you can say. You definitely can't say, wow, this was a total failure and it didn't work because they already spent the money. They're not going back, right? There's a process to following this that, um, that does support the, the, you know, the types of decisions that you make. And the last little bit here I want to share is the DNA of an evidence-based practitioner. Uh, some of, uh, and there's a lot of different things, qualities, uh, characteristics, personality traits, different things that lend themselves not only to the type of person that would be drawn to this type of practice, but also somebody who can engage with it well. Uh, and Nicole, to your earlier uh, points, I think some of these will, will get at that. Number one is healthy skepticism and subtext is, is courage as well. So healthy skepticism, and I, I say healthy, it's a key word here because in the last five years with COVID, with, with everything that you know, we've seen in society, uh, skepticism has really gone off the rails in a big way. People who are overly skeptical, conspiratorial, conspiracy theories, don't believe anything. That's not even really skepticism. I think that's you know, taking this way too far, but a healthy skepticism, a balance between um, really, you know, believing everything you hear and, and nothing, but uh, a quality that will help you take a step back and question and, and, the, and having the courage to ask that question as well as part of the skepticism. Number two is intellectual humility. I think again, a really, really foundational quality to being willing to number one, be critical of yourself, be critical of your expertise, ask the hard questions, you know, am I right? Uh, am I basing my judgment on information that might be less relevant? Um, and have, being humble, being willing to change your opinions when new evidence comes up is another really important quality. And the third is communication. Uh, I think a lot of people mistakenly assume that if they just have the evidence, if they've gathered really good evidence, that they will be more persuasive and more influential using that evidence. And there's, there's good evidence to say that that is not the case. Uh, in, in many cases, coming to the table with evidence actually has um, a backlash effect, right? And people dig in their heels to that. Um, and having really good communication skills, I mean, this could be a completely different topic of conversation. How do you actually communicate influentially using evidence? But uh, one thing I can say is that using evidence um, for, you know, and communicating evidence, number one, uh, use the evidence to open the conversation, not to close it, right? It's very hard to change people's mind by beating them over the head with good evidence, even if you're right. Um, use it to open a conversation and also invest in relationships. Again, don't assume that just because you've had, you, you have the backing of evidence that people are gonna listen to you. At the end of the day, evidence-based practice is a mindset. It's an identity that you can assume and it's a value. If you place the value on evidence, uh, it's, you know, it, it's sort of encompassing of all of those things. And again, we're short on time, but if you wanna develop your skills, you wanna read more, 
Uh, a couple of resources here for you. Number one is scienceforwork.com, an organization that I'm a part of that I work with. We translate scientific organizational evidence uh, and research um, and try and make it more accessible and, and applicable for people. We're partnered with SEBMA, which is the Center for Evidence-Based Management, SEBMA.org. Um, and they have a lot of educational resources, including this book, Evidence-Based Management, over here, available for purchase. Really, um, it's really like a playbook, skill building, tactical uh, resource that, again, if you want to build your skills in this area, it's a great place to get started. Uh, and the CIPD. CIPD is the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development based out of London in the UK. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's an organization that is really committed to uh, educating and building resources around evidence-based practice and decision making. So uh, just a couple places you can go next if you want to learn more um, about this and, and build your skills. And so with that, uh, thank you all for spending your lunchtime with me. Thank you for talking about this with me. I love this topic. I love talking about it. So I, I really appreciate you all coming out and sharing in it. Uh, if you want to learn more, if you want to argue with me about generational differences, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, email me directly. Um, I, I'd love to talk about this stuff. Please get in touch. Uh, if you want to learn more about MHS assessments, my organization and the work we do as far as uh, developing talent assessments and uh, OD solutions uh, for organizations, training programs, coaching, um, you can go to MHS.com. You can connect with me directly to, uh, to learn more about that. Um, and we're close to time, but if we have any more time, any questions, any comments, I, I'm, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for having this Thank session. You. I learned a lot. Hey. I think Thank we'll just kind of wrap it up. Michael, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone that really showed up. I'm just looking at my notes here that I took a little bit of this, um, just your background in terms of evidence that you discussed with us, some of the steps to become more evidence-based. And uh, just as a follow-up, I know comments are put in the chat, um, the link where you guys are gonna be able to find the recording, some information that you would definitely would wanna look into this more and some upcoming events that we might have as well. And just thank you for everyone else for also contributing their inputs from their uh, workplace or experiences that they've had in terms of evidence-based at their job. And I think we'll wrap it up. Clemente, you wanna add anything? No, I just wanna thank uh, Michael, uh, especially for taking, his, uh, taking time out of his busy schedule to speak with us. Uh, it was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and then lastly, apart from the resources that you'll be able to find on our website, so the event recording, the slides, and some additional information, um, if you have any topics that you would like for us to explore this upcoming year, um, again, applying IO psychology to what we do as higher education administrators, feel free to shoot me an email or, uh, or Robinson. Um, following this event, most likely by tomorrow, I'll send out an email to everyone saying, hey, you know, the resources are posted. You can respond back there um, and just say, hey, you know, we want to up, touch upon these topics and we can see how we can get that coordinated for the spring. So thank you for attending. Thank you, Michael, again uh, for your time. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. It was a great, great workshop. Thank you. Thank you.